Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Riot Science Club seminar of October by Eiko Fried, which is titled The Lack of Theory Building and Testing Impedes Progress in the Factor and Network Literature. We will wait just a couple of minutes uh, so that everyone who wants to join has the time to get their cup of coffee and actually join, and then we'll get started. But as we're waiting, I wanted to briefly update you all on something that we've been working on as a RICE team. We have been in contact with the Dean of the Erasmus MC about giving out credits for attending our sessions in the form of ECTs, which will work for everyone in Europe. For every three seminars of the RICE that you attend, you can now award yourself 0.1 ECT. Um, and if you need someone to approve your attendance for your ECTs, you can contact us via email. But if you do so, make sure you log on to MS Teams with an account that has your name attached. You can see all of our upcoming seminars in this flyer, including those at the other sites, so King's College London and Exeter. And if you want to keep posted on our upcoming seminars, which are all now online, you can subscribe to our mailing list and we'll put the details about our website and the mailing list in the Q&A box. All right, so on to our session of today. Our speaker today will be Eiko Fried, who is an assistant professor at Leiden University with a main interest in studying individual symptoms of mental disorders and their causal relations, but he also has a broader interest in measurement, modeling, ontology, and nosology. Today, he will talk about the lack of theory building and testing, and mainly about statistical and theoretical models, how we fail to explicate theories about psychological constructs and the strengths of the theories that do exist. We'll put the link to the related preprint also in the Q&A so that you, have, uh, you can have a look whenever you like. And some housekeeping rules, this meeting is a live event and that unfortunately means that as an attendee, you're not able to unmute yourself and ask your questions directly, but we have a Q&A button where we encourage everyone to drop their questions either during or after a meeting. Lorenza and I will be monitoring this Q&A and ask all your burning questions to Eiko uh, at the end of the talk. I think that's it for me. Uh, so Eiko, take it away. Thanks. So Hi. we have until uh, four o'clock, right? Or we have an hour. Yes. So I'll, I'll cut it a little short so we have some time for Q&A in the end because I, um, I, that's how I learned from the participants here. Um, can I post my Mentimeter link in the uh, Q&A as well? Or is that the yes, right that would place? Be perfect. So folks, welcome to this talk. I'm going to start with a Mentimeter uh, that you can find in the description in the Q&A uh, announcement. Please move there right now and answer the questions because I want to adapt my talk to who you are. Um, and if we have 50 medical students here versus 50 statistical versus 50 psychological students, the talk needs to be a little different. Um, let's see. I think I want to share my screen now. Yep, I'm going to. Just put over overwrite. Um, share just my screen. And I hope you can see the Mentimeter here now. Yes. So don't let me hanging, folks. Please fill out the questions in the Mentimeter so I, I get an idea. 
Okay. Looks pretty psychiatric so far. Some epidemiology medicine in there. Social psychology, public health, medicines, all hail medicines. Clinical psych. Okay, psychology is gaining traction. I'm sorry, by the way, my washing machine is running in the background. I'll try to close my door. I hope it's not too loud. Genetics, statistics. Okay, the typical mix of, uh, of folks. I'm going to give it a minute more. Um, psychiatry, psychology are the biggest ones. Some epidemiology, neuroscience, very interesting. Um, okay, I'm going to go to the next slide. Um, I, I want to know how much you guys know about structural equation models. Um, and that's the last thing I have, just to get a, a basic idea of how detailed I, I need to talk about statistics today. I probably don't need to adapt my talk if most people have heard about SEM before. Um, and I can spend a bit more on theory formation. I'm going to give it 20 more seconds. But it looks like most of you have heard the term SEM before. Um, okay. Um, thanks for that. Then I'll go to my slides. Uh, Elizabeth, can you see the slides now? Excellent. Thanks for the feedback. All right. Uh, slides are online. Talk will be online after this. So I'm just going to go right through it. Um, I'll introduce uh, the, the core issues, three problems, and then I conclude with ways to fix everything. Um, thanks for the invitation uh, to the Riot Club. It's very kind of you to, to have me. Um, it's, uh, the, the talk is about a paper in Preston Psych Inquiry. Um, the, uh, the, the organizers of the event linked to it in the chat already. So let me get right into it. Um, there's a Mr. Lorvenstein comic um, that, that some of you might have seen before. Um, where the researcher um, apparently uh, talks to data, the data says no, and the person is really upset afterwards. I uh, adapted the comic and then actually bought the print of the comic as well to support <laughs> to support the artist. Um, and I think of it as such: you have a theory, uh, the data tells you no, and then you're sort of sad uh, about your theory. Um, but I don't think that's the case in psychology or psychiatry. Too often, I think uh, we have other scenarios, three scenarios that are problematic. The first scenario is that uh, you have a theory and because your statistical model and your theoretical model are so far away from each other and from the data, you cannot bring your data to bear on your theory. And that means the data are uninformative and you're left with open questions. Data didn't really help you very much. The second uh, situation, arguably more problematic, is when you have a latent, a hidden theory you don't explicate your theory, but you have it in your head. Um, so I grade it out here. And then the data cannot bear on your theory because we don't know what your theory is. But then you tell us in your paper that your theory was confirmed. That's quite common, uh, unfortunately, especially in psychology. The third problem is what I call a weak theory, where you have sort of a theory. Um, you tell us a little bit about it in your paper, but not really enough that we have a good idea. And then uh, you cannot bring your data to bear on your theory. And the data actually reject your theory, but then you tell us that the data actually proves your theory to be correct because there's some sort of excuse. In social psychology, for example, the most common excuse for this is called a hidden moderator, that there's something weird about your data, but in other data, surely your theory will be confirmed. So these are the issues I will talk about today. How this looks like, uh, how this should look like, I think you're, you, you should try very hard to choose a statistical model that matches your theoretical model to help you enable to bring your data to bear on your theory. And that way you can modify your theory based on statistical models and data, update your theory, and then keep going. And you can see in the fourth picture, the person is smiling because that's what science is all about. There's no um, negative outcome of this. We just want to learn how the world works. So let me start with um, sort of uh, my criticism of the open science community, if I may, um, uh, which I wholeheartedly endorse open science. And I, I think folks are doing extremely important work and more has happened in the last decade than in the last hundred years in, in psychology, particularly. So that's great. Um, but there's a problem. So 
we've become a lot better at identifying and preventing questionable research practices like p-hacking and other things via tools like pre-registration, for example. And I think that's fantastic, um, especially uh, due to so many young people, many of which are here today. But the identified challenges and proposed solutions have focused on improving the replicability of statistical findings via improving, uh, improving methods. And in the best case, what this does, it, it leads to more robust effects. It leads to more robust statistical effects. And then you say, Eichel, well, what's the problem? And I would say, well, thank you for the question, uh, Elizabeth. <laughs> uh, I would say, you know, there's no inherent problem in the beginning, and there have been great contributions. There's multi-lab pre-registered replication studies, the amazing psych science accelerator, um, uh, and oh my, but, but statistical effects require explaining. They don't do the explaining. And there's a fantastic paper by Cummins, 2000, who says in psychology, we are overwhelmed with things to explain and with effects, basically, and somewhat underwhelmed by things to explain them with. And this has, has, led, me, has led many uh, scholars to argue that there's a crisis of theory. And after reading the literature myself over the last five or six years, um, I would conclude that the theory glass in our field is at best half empty. And I'm just going to generalize that to epidemiology, neuroscience, and psychiatry, and the other folks here today. I, I think that's true. Now, today I'll talk about psychological constructs, which are hopefully relevant to epidemiology, psychiatry as well. Um, what are they, and what is the relation between these constructs and their measures? And I will focus on mental illness because it's my area of research, but you can use any of these constructs uh, and exercise the talk through in your head with your own construct if you want. So there are two basic theories about how the world works. In the first theory, there's a construct, uh, cognitive ability, personality, depression, and the construct causes its measures, right? So uh, uh, how smart you are causes how you will perform on intelligence items. Uh, how depressed you are causes your sadness, insomnia, and concentration problems, and so forth. This goes back to infectious diseases, where the model is definitely true. Your bacterial infection causes uh, fever, cough, and so forth. Um, I'm actually not going to go into the details here. There, there's the G factor of, of intelligence, where people have argued this is the case. There's the P factor of psychopathology, where the idea is that there's this one thing that causes a lot of psychopathological problems. And um, in personality traits, the argument has been made as well. Um, that uh, personality causes and explains the consistent pattern of thoughts, feelings, and actions. Um, the alternative idea theoretical model here is the network theory, where, for example, symptoms of depression are not caused by depression, but where depression is an emergent property that comes out of interactions among symptoms. So insomnia leads to fatigue, fatigue leads to concentration problems, concentration problems leads to uh, difficulties with your partner, leads to anger attacks, leads to more insomnia, and so forth. Um, uh, and again, I'm just using an example here. Uh, using depression, this works for many other constructs in psychology. Um, personal note here, I think both theories are false because they're oversimplified, of course, but for the sake of this talk, we will sort of think of these two as distinct alternative explanations of the correlations in psychological data that we observe, that all of us see. Stuff is correlated. Why is it correlated? Because it's caused by one thing or because things cause each other both lead to the correlations among our items and our data. Now, if you use or if you believe in network theory, if that's your baseline, your theoretical approach, you probably want to use statistical models that can do network models, basically. Uh, it's a class of models called network psychometrics. I'm going to skip the details here. But there are statistical models that can estimate networks, and you probably want to do this if you're interested in networks. If you're interested in the idea of a common cause, you could, for example, use factor models, um, structural equation models, such as confirmatory factor analyses, and they decompose the variance of, let's say, 15 depression items into one or two or three latent variables, um, which one could argue cause the relations among your items or explain the relations among your items, right? So it would be like measles is the latent variable here, 
Uh, we live in the 18th century. We cannot observe measles as an infection itself because we don't have microscopes, but we can see the symptoms of measles and, and we can use a factor model to find out that all of these symptoms share a lot of variants with each other, measles. All right, part two, let's talk about the three big problems that I see. Um, I'll actually skip this because we come back to it later, sorry. <clears throat> so the first issue is conflation of statistical and theoretical models. Um, in the comic you can see um, that this person says, I get confused a lot. Here's a picture of me being confused yesterday. And then the other person says, that's not you. And then the person says, oh, no, shit. And this is me. Oops. Basically, this is me reading the scientific literature often. Um, and I truly believe that, especially in our field, uh, the word model has been so problematic because people use the word model and it's unclear to me as a reader if they mean statistical model, theoretical model, computational model, um, and so forth. So, the theoretical ideas I just introduced, network theory and common cost theory, are competing. They cannot both be true, at least in this blanket, simplified form. They cannot both be true at the same time. But factor models and network models are statistically equivalent under a set of conditions I'm not going to go into in today. But broadly speaking, uh, they're equivalent. And that means if you fit a network model or a factor model to data, you get the same fit to the data, no matter what generated your data. Um, and that's, I think, really important to understand, no matter in what field you work. So let me give you an example. Uh, on the left side, I pretend this is the true model now. I make a model myself. This is the true network model, and I simulate data from it. Now I fit the model on the right side to the data, and I get perfect fit. Left network model, right factor model. Now I do it the other way around. I take the right model as a true model, I simulate data from it, I fit the left model to it, I get perfect fit. And that's called statistical equivalence. And that's really important because it means that fitting either of these models to the data cannot tell you what generated your data. It cannot, cannot give you insights into causal mechanisms of your data because the models are, have equal fit to each other, uh, at least in cross-sectional data. And that means that the model fit tells you very little about the mechanisms that generated your data and this in return means that a factor model cannot be taken as evidence that there is a common cause underlying your data. And, and the literature has done this a lot. If you work in these areas, you have seen sentences like this all the time. And likewise, fitting a, fact, a network model to data cannot tell you stuff about interventions on the system, for example, because you need to know first if there's actually a network theoretical model underlying your data. And fitting a statistical model will not be able to give you that answer. U2 model equivalence. So that's really important to understand, I think. Yeah, I call it the inference gap. Um, so uh, it, it, yeah, it's an open question, what generated your data, uh, irrespective of the statistical models you fit to your data. And that applies to anything, not just these two classes of models. It's just an example. Um, there are many examples from this applied literature in which people commit this fallacy or this ignore this inference gap here. Um, this is a quote, for example, saying that uh, we fit a p-factor model, we fit a factor model, for example, and then saying repli replication of this factor model underscores the importance and utility of transdiagnostic treatment. But there's a big <laughs> inference gap between decomposing your covariance matrix into a number of factors and believing that these factors actually cause your data and should be intervened upon in treatment. It's, it's not supported by the data. It's a possibility, but it is not a given. And you have the same problem in the network literature. Here's from a paper that, that argues that, so they fit the network model to the data. They find that some of these nodes are more connected than other nodes. They have stronger relations, and they conclude that these um, uh, constitute the backbone that sustains depressive symptoms. So they conclude that there are causal mechanisms in the data but that is not supported by fitting a model to the data. Um, all right. Yeah, maybe just importantly, uh, the most common problem in, in our area is where people uh, take a statistical model as theoretical model, and that just doesn't hold. And importantly, statistical equivalence holds no matter how good your data are. 
it doesn't matter. The quality or quantity doesn't matter. You can have millions of observations. Um, this problem is not solvable, at least in, in data we commonly have. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about uh, other data later. Okay, part two, uh, latent theories and psychometric cakes. Um, so looking, so I, I started this project six or seven years ago. It's the paper I've taken the longest to write up. And um, I have fit, I have papers in the factor literature, I have papers in the network literature. Um, and most of the work in these literatures to me with a bit of distance look like well executed sort of cakes that followed a standard baking recipe. And if you've read, maybe you're more familiar with the factor modeling literature, uh, you fit one or two or three factors to your correlation matrix, you do a chi-square test or something to see how many factors you should extract, and then you fit a CFA and you allow for cross-loadings, and then you have a model with three factors and 12 items standard. That's thousands of papers. Um, and, and sometimes these models are quite sophisticated, but I don't know what I can learn from them. I, I don't understand how they inform theory formation. So you find two factors in your depression data set or three factors in your schizophrenia data set. Wow, how, how does that help me move forward? I'm not saying it cannot, but I'm saying I need more information. I need you to do some theoretical work um, to, to help the field move forward with anything. Fitting a model to a data set does not by itself do anything. And I say this as somebody who has fit a lot of models to a lot of data. So, you know, I'm, if I'm pointing fingers, they're also pointing my way. So I'll skip this here. So the network, network literature often in the last 10 years has taken an interesting data set, has sort of baked it in the network model oven. There are three or four typical models we use. And then you do some inference at the end and say, okay, this item is the most central one in the network or something like that. And I have a footnote here. Um, and I could give an, a whole talk on this. I really truly believe that there's a lot of value in exploratory hypothesis generating work, but that's not the topic of my talk today. So here for today, I'm gonna to be critical with only doing exploratory work because at some point we need to get theory going. Uh, just fitting models to data forever is not sufficient to help treating depression, for example. So I don't know what these papers often mean. I, I don't know what we can learn from that. Likewise, for the factor literature, it's pretty much the same. You follow standard baking recipes. Uh, the only difference is that that literature is about half a decade older than the network literature, but networks can be sort of reformulated as structural equation models. So it's, it's really just the same thing all over again. Um, and when I read these papers, after 50, 60 years of doing that, I'm still not sure why people chose a factor model. Why not a different model? Uh, how, what are the factors that they find? How do they inform theory formation? What does it mean? Uh, obviously, there are uh, there are exa counter examples to this. I'm not describing every single paper. I'm not making the claim that every paper is horrible. Uh, I'm just saying that in general, and I've read hundreds of papers or over a hundred of papers uh, using factor models in the depression literature. The large majority will not do any theoretical work. They will just fit a, a data set, a model to a data set and publish it. So uh, about three years ago, I received a very critical review um, that I found was really well well argued. The authors, uh, the reviewer said, the anonymous reviewer said, uh, the authors do not provide a compelling rationale for using a network model. Can the authors show a substantial increment or leverage offered by this network model? What theoretical or scientific question is at stake here? Um, and I fully agree with this review. I, I, it really changed my, my view. It was one of these moments where you step back and say, like, what am I doing here? Um, and I'm going to add the green color here for factor models as well. I think you can say exactly the same for pretty much any factor modeling paper out there uh, in the last few years, at least in my domain of research. Again, there are exceptions to this, of course. Um, and I'm going to give you an example now why I think you need to tell us why you use a certain statistical model. Um, so let's take factor models. The theoretical motivation for using a factor model is not self-explanatory, given what is called syntactical equivalence. That means you can have different causal interpretations of the same statistical model. And there are two common interpretations. The first one is realist and causal. So that means that the G factor exists maybe in the brain and it causes intelligence to some degree or you respond to some intelligence items 
or the P factor for, for mental illness exists. Uh, it's in the genes or in the brain or somewhere else. And it causes how likely you are to get depression and, and anxiety and so forth. Some people hold that belief. Um, uh, others do not. A, a second interpretation uh, or theoretical motivation is to say, no, I, I just want to summarize my data. I'm agnostic about the causal processes underlying my data. I just want to use a factor model to decompose my, my variants and make my items fewer. Um, that's probably valid. Now, when I talk to researchers in this field, they often tell me they are agnostic um, in terms of just wanting to summarize their data. But when I read the papers, the interpretations are causal. Um, they often talk about the latent variable causing the items, underlying the items, and so forth. Um, so these are direct quotes from a number of papers. I have the sources in my preprint. The latent variable explains the cooperation of items. It directly influences the items. Uh, authors identified underlying latent variables, um, and so forth, and so forth, and so forth. The literature is extremely causally interpreted, but uh, based on cross-sectional data where this cannot follow. That's the inference gap I'm talking about. And again, maybe for some of you not working on this, this is super nitty gritty detailed stuff, but it's just, it's a broad area people work on. So I use it as an example for this paper uh, because you need to criticize something uh, concretely so people believe you that there's a problem. there. Uh, I call these latent theories rather than absent theories um, because the authors hold theories. That's why they write about causal processes in the conclusion, in the abstract, maybe in the discussion, but they don't, in the introduction, say we have a causal theory. They just interpret sort of the results as causal. Um, so, so yeah, the, the causality is implied rather than sort of explicated properly in terms of a theory. Again, there are exceptions. Cuspy and Moffitt in my field, for example, have a, written a very clear paper where they say, no, we, have, we believe that the P factor is causal, um, but most, most folks in this area haven't done that. I'm going to skip this. There's a good review paper on the topic. Um, if you don't believe me, believe Ashley Watts, who has written on this um, fantastic early career scholar. Going back to the sort of broader point, if a theory doesn't guide the selection of a statistical model, the inferences that you draw from fitting a model to the data are really hard to do because your statistical model needs to match your theoretical model to bring your data to bear on your theory. And um, yeah, that's really challenging in the literature. Uh, this lack of attention to theory has led to what I think of as really weird sort of baking recipes that people have been following mindlessly for decades. I'm just going to give you one simple example. Um, when I publish papers using network models, I every single time get asked by the editor or by the reviewer to report Cronbach's alpha for the rating scale I'm using. So I have, I don't know, a 15 item depression scale or something, and I need to report internal consistency of the scale in my measurement section, in my measure section. And that's a weird thing to say to somebody using a network model, because I believe in network theory. I don't believe that my items are caused by one latent variable. And Cronbach's alpha assumes that your items are caused by one underlying variable. That's why you estimate inter-item reliability, in in reliability in the first place, because you want to know how well items relate to each other and then and hence reflect the underlying variable. So let's look at the, at the example of my paper here. Uh, you have a factor model. Let's say we have five items now. You fit a factor model to your data. Um, or you simply use the Cronbach's alpha function in SPSS or, or, or Jasper or somewhere else, and you find out that the first item represents your latent variable really badly. It has a super low factor loading. It has low correlation with the other items. Um, and SPSS will tell you, hey, Ico, if you remove item X1 from your rating scale, Cronbach's alpha will dramatically improve. Um, so I, I simulate that in my paper and, and give a bit more numbers for this, but here it would go up from, I don't know, 0.4 to 0.7 or something like that. And so psychologists often simply remove that item without thinking at all about theory. They use Cronbach's alpha sort of as a baking recipe, but they don't understand the consequences and implications and assumptions underlying this method. 
Now, I simulate data from the model on the right-hand side, and you get the equivalent model on the left side. This is a network model now. And in this model, X1 is the causal trigger for a chain of causality that goes through the other items. Now, all of a sudden, it makes no sense at all to delete the first item from your rating scale, because while it has a weak causal influence on the other items, and indirect for some of the items, it is crucial to starting a causal process. So what I'm saying here is that if you use methods like chromos alpha, you really need to think about what it does uh, and what it assumes, rather than mindlessly using it on your data because some reviewer or editor tells you to. And then, of course, there are many, many other possible causal pathways here and many other possible theoretical models to take into account. I'm just offering you one example here to exemplify the point. Okay, third and last point. I, I want to get through this and really have some, some time for Q&A and, and discussion so I can learn uh, a few things from you, few, from you and your questions. Um, I want to talk about weak theories and why I think there are poor theories and how we can do better. So when I was in, in my master's, and you can see a picture here of me in my master's a uh, long time ago, I tried to formalize, I, I tried to write an agent-based model to find out whether depression can be an adaptive strategy. So an agent-based model is basically a model where you have a number of, of agents or people uh, in a group and they interact with each other over time and then things can happen. It's like the, the Sims or something like that. Um, and to program that agent-based model, I need parameters. I need to know the group size. I need to know, uh, I don't know. I need to know a lot of information about uh, depression and these theories. And there are many, many theories on depression as an adaptive strategy. There's an entire field on that. And depression is the most commonly written disorder in, about in that field. So there, there's over a dozen theory papers on this. I think there are four or five review papers at this stage because the literature is so large. And so I had all these questions as a master's student. And here on the next slide, I will show you how many answers I found to my questions. So the whole thing was a failure. I didn't find any information about any of the parameters I wanted to know in the published theoretical literature. Um, and that means that the theories proposed in the literature were sort of inherently unfalsifiable or unmodifiable by evidence, um, if you consider agent-based models and evidence, uh, evidence here for the sake of the argument. And whether depression came out as adaptive or maladaptive in my agent-based model depended entirely on the theorist, in this case me, but not the theory, in this case the, the literature. So I could not bring any data or sort of fake data, simulated data, any model to, to bear on the theory because the theory was unclear in the end. It was just a narrative summary, but it was not a really a theory. So I want to conclude with some strong theories. What are strong theories compared to weak theories and how can we do better in getting to strong theories? No matter in what field you work, strong theories are important. So, start, and I have some, some references below um, on all of these slides. Um, strong theories are precise sets of non-ambiguous axioms or assumptions. Um, non-ambiguous means that usually you want to write them down as equations rather than narrative descriptions because language is less, um, is more ambiguous than, than mathematics. Strong theories offer a explanation of a phenomenon, not just a description of data. That's an effect, not an explanation. Strong theories are independent of theorists. And again, writing something down as an equation helps with that rather than writing it down narratively. Strong theories enable testing of theory in data. So a strong theory gives you very clear guidance on what statistical model to use and then you can help to bring your data to bear on your theory by updating your theory based on the model and the data. Strong theories are often formalized. So here's an example of a strong theory of panic disorder and panic attacks um, that we've worked on for, I think, five years by now. The first author is Don Robinow. All of these arrows here are difference equations. I'm not going to go into details here. Uh, the preprint is very applied. It's the best no, to me, best known 
description of a formalized model for non-formal uh, or technical researchers. So if you're an applied psychologist or an applied epidemiologist or applied psychiatrist, you can read that paper. And it's a really good introduction paper to getting an idea of why formal theories are important and how to do it um, precisely using a very sort of simple example of panic disorder. Uh, again, I'm not going to go into the details here. Um, strong theories grant inference tickets. So in philosophy of science, an inference ticket is something uh, where you get information without having to do something. So if you understand, truly understand, the uh, water cycle on Earth, how the clouds rain and, and how the rivers take the water to the seas and how the, the seas get, give the water back to the clouds and so forth. If you truly understand all of that, you can, in your mind or in a computer model, simulate what would happen under circumstances that are not realized currently. And that allows us to have prediction uh, models in how the environment and, and the atmosphere will change given certain factors that humans may intervene on or not. That's an inference ticket. You don't get that from just description of data. You need to truly understand something to be able to intervene without actually intervening and still getting valid data and prediction. Um, I'm going to stop here. Yeah, here's a workshop that we taught together with Don Robinow at SIPS 2019 on uh, formalizing uh, psychological theories um, and why it also improves open science. I, I truly believe that a open theory that is clear and non-ambiguous and can be much easier corroborated or falsified by independent theorists is better than a rough narrative description that is impenetrable to criticism. So I think formal theories are inherently an open science topic as well. And the workshop makes that point in detail. Uh, all the slides are online, so you can just check that out. Again, neither Don and I are technical people. Don is a practicing psychotherapist who has done obviously a tremendous job of working himself into this literature. He's become a super strong statistician as well. But his background is clinical psychology, and the same holds for me. I don't see patients, but I, I'm trained as a clinical psychologist in Germany. I've worked on statistics for some time, but I'm not a statistician by training. And so if we could pick up how to model difference equations in R, you, you guys can do that too, if you're interested in it. Last couple of slides, um, 2010 to 2020 was sort of the time of establishing robust effects. And I hope that the next 10 years can be a decade of establishing better theories in, in our field. Um, one benefit I didn't talk about so far, I'm going to skip this here, is control. So um, I showed you that these two models are statistically equivalent to each other in cross-sectional data. And if you have temporal or longitudinal data, this helps a little bit because you know that arrows can be cannot be oriented backwards. There is no causality backwards in time, but statistical equivalence is still a problem in uh, temporal data as much. It, it doesn't solve the problem, but control or intervention does. So, um, and this needs empirical work. So we need strong theories and we need empirical work. If you believe, so uh, this is depression here. These are ten depression symptoms. If you believe that a latent sort of brain disorder causes depression symptoms and you intervene on one of the symptoms, uh, sleep problems, then the severity of the other pr problems should remain unaffected because they're independent based on the latent variable. Uh, if you have measles and I treat your cough, the complex spots, the red dots in your mouth will not go away, another symptom, because I didn't treat the underlying condition, I simply suppressed one of your symptoms, right? But if insomnia has a causal feedback loop, a vicious cycle with, uh, I don't know, fatigue and concentration problems and sad mood, if a network theory generates your data, then intervening or controlling insomnia should reduce other problems as well. And so interventions are a fantastic way for us moving forward to sort of tickle the system and find out um, more about the data generating mechanism here. Another way forward are, is to formalize theories properly. 
here's a paper accepted in, in uh, perspectives and especially from perspectives on why this is important. It's a very brief paper, but I, I think it gives a really nice overview again by Don Robinow and, and some colleagues in Amsterdam. Um, and yeah, I showed this before. I think this is how the empirical and theoretical cycles should come together. Um, and, and we should be happy doing it. I think it's fantastic work. Um, not frustrating. Uh, shout out. So when I started this 2014, 15, um, there wasn't too much work on this in psychology itself. And just in the last two years, there are more papers published on the topic of theory formation than I can put on the slide here. Um, I, I strongly recommend reading those. I have a reading list at the end of this talk. Um, oh, here is the reading list. You can find a, you can find it on the Open Science Framework following that link. I put, I don't know, 30, 40 papers in there and book chapters that I thought were the most instructive ones in my journey in the last five years of trying to understand what a model is and what a theory is and, and um, what the relationship between models and theories are and so forth. Finally, the paper that I talked about today has received seven commentaries. Five of them are, I think, online as preprints. And I also published my rebuttal uh, just last week. Um, uh, and I think together, yeah, I, I was really humbled by, by getting so much feedback and, and criticism. And I think together these make for really nice reading material. But obviously I'm a little biased here because it's, um, it's my baby. I worked on this really hard for a long time. Um, so, yeah. so in the end, I conclude after working on this and after seeing so much literature that the theory glass in psychology might not be half empty, but rather half full. And uh, I want to end the talk by thanking especially Don Robino, but a lot of other collaborators who thought this through with me and inspired me over the years and, and shared their feedback with me and, and criticized me and um, yeah, kept me working on this project. And of course, thanks to everybody who's listening to this today. Uh, this is much more fun doing it in person, but I think I hope we can make it a little interactive with the Q&A session now. Um, yeah, and thanks to Ride for organizing this. Uh, that's, that's it. Wonderful, Echo. Thank you so much for this interesting talk. Uh, I think it really uh, made a lot of people think, at least it did make me think about how well I thought about the theory before choosing my own statistical models, but oh well. Uh, we have some questions already for you in the chat, so I'm going to start off with one from Fabio. And he asked, I think this was uh, during the part that you were explaining uh, the factor in the network models. And he said, one question might be, what about the use of these techniques and tools for screening only? Is there any backfire there? So, um, uh I'm not entirely sure um, about the background of the question. When we screen, so when we use screening tools, we usually give people questionnaires. And um, for depression, we give them the back depression inventory, for example. And then when somebody has more than 15 points or, or something like that, uh, it indicates a probable diagnosis of major depression. But I think these screening tools are not inherently related to factor or network models in the first place. And so I think you can use these tools as, as measurement tools uh, without having a certain belief about how the items come about. And I, I work a lot on depression. I think it doesn't matter if a brain disorder causes all your symptoms or if symptoms cause each other. You probably still want to know what, what people's symptoms are because they impair people. Uh, suicidal ideation is, a, is one of the symptoms. So I think independently of how you believe depression relations among symptoms come about, you measurement wouldn't change very much. Um, I, I have more complicated thoughts in this writing a paper on how to measure th stuff from a network perspective, but I think that's my sort of brief general response. Um. Thank you. Uh, then we have another question. Um, so uh, Anonymous says, I agree with what you said about rationale for factor models, but a viewer said that we should not need to motivate why we use PCA or factor analysis because it is useless. How would you be able to state that we should rationalize why we use PCA or factor analysis? I, I think that's a great question. Um, I don't think providing a rationale for a model is useless. I disagree with the reviewer, but I, I, I see why some people might say this. 
So to me, the core difference between the two models you list here, factor models and, and principal components analyses, is that one model is a reflective latent variable model, the factor analysis, and that means that the latent variable has errors towards your items, which some people interpret as the latent variable causes your items. And the principal components analysis is a formative latent variable model where the arrows go from your items to the latent variable, which to us means usually that your principal component is sort of an index. Like socioeconomic status is a good example where you measure income and neighborhood and education, I don't know, stuff like that. And then you construct a formative score, uh, SES, but intervening on income uh, and intervening on income or neighborhood changes your SES, right? Because the arrows go from the items to the latent variable. Um, intelligence, on the other hand, is often thought of as a reflective latent variable. Uh, people use factor models for that because the idea is that your cognitive abilities determine cause your answers on items that you answer. What is two plus two, for example? And sort of prohibiting or changing your way you answer two plus two doesn't change your intelligence. The causal arrow doesn't go this way around. And there's a great paper by Mike Ramtola. I'm going to put this here. Ramtola in chat. Worse than measurement error. Uh, and this paper, if you Google that, you'll find it. If This paper shows that if you fit, if data comes from a reflective latent variable model and you fit a PCA to it, you get misfit. And the other way around, if your data comes from a PCA and you fit a reflective latent variable model to it, like a factor model, you get misfit. And so I think there are uh, cause, and that's my opinion, and some other people hold that opinion as well, but, but other folks disagree. Um, there's a paper by Wiedermann, 1993, showing that PCA and factor analysis often lead to different results in the same data set. So I do think it matters, and your rationalization, in my view, should follow causal ideas uh, about the data. Um, if you want to be super agnostic about your data generating mechanism, I think PCA is the better method because it has fewer assumptions on your data um, than factor analysis. That's my take. Thank you. It's very interesting to see that there is also a difference between uh, the PCA and factor analysis in terms of uh, theoretical, um, a theoretical approach. Then we have a question from Martin uh, Fasilev. Do you have any advice on how to develop a strong theory on a new under-researched topic where not all of the parameters or underlying mechanisms are known? Do you think we need a lot of evidence before we can start building such strong theories? It's, uh, the question is so good that it, it appears as if it planted in the audience because that's <laughs> been on my mind for such a long time. It's a great question. So um, Don Robineau, uh, so wrote this paper called um, uh, Formalized Theory, sort of about calibers. I showed that pretty late in my in my uh, uh, slides. Um, I'm actually going to copy the URL just to answer that question better. Let me scroll for half a second here. I'll have it in a in a minute. Um, uh, I can find it. Sorry. Here. Here's the link. Um, Invisible hands and fine collectors. So in this paper, we make the argument that you should start with formalizing theories irrespective of how much evidence you have in your field. Because it can never be too early to think clearly about the components in your theory, the relations of components in your theory, and how to measure the components in your theory. So in my mind, a formalized theory is always a network model. Uh, a theoretical model that has components, it has elements, and it has arrows between these. I think that's how the world works. Um, and it's tricky. What components do you add? What are the relations? What function do you give these relations? Um, and I'm going to say, quite frankly, we chose panic disorder for our first computational model because there's so much agreement on what panic disorder is. It hasn't changed much in the last hundred years. It's super commonly known. It's a very robust phenomenon. There's lots of research on the relations between components. The vicious cycle in panic disorder is commonly accepted by pretty much any theorist. So that's an easy construct to do this. Um, I, I also want to say that writing a formalized model is a process that might take you know, many years or decades, and you will update your model, and you will put it out there, and people will help you and criticize it and, and add components and remove relations. Uh, it's just an ongoing process, as is every theory formation. 
this idea that people in psychology write a theory paper and then they're done is bizarre to me and mostly an artifact of how publishing works, that you write a PDF that cannot be changed anymore afterwards. I don't think that's how it works. For our panic disorder paper, we'll have a, a sort of animation online with all the parameters where people can drag around the components and add relations, and that's our model. It's completely transparent. People can criticize it, falsify it, add components to it. Um, so I think, I think these models are a starting point for theory formation not an endpoint, and the paper I link to makes the argument, and and others disagree with that vehemently. So this is just a this is just my opinion. Um, I think this is a really nice point, and it was an excellent question indeed. And and I agree. You can sometimes, as a researcher, feel like I don't have enough knowledge to formulate a proper theory, but you need to start somewhere. And uh, if you put it out there, then people can start, as exactly as you said, criticizing and adding to it and build upon that. So that, yeah, that would be great if we do that more. All right, next question. Uh, I'm, um, I'm curious about this latest point. I, I, well, uh, this is hard to reference without the slides, but um, aside from very specific interventions, tasks, I feel that many interventions we implement end up producing broad rather than specific effects. Does this interfere with our ability to evaluate whether intervening or uh, on insomnia, for example, has a causal effect on other symptoms? Again, a super, super interesting question. Thanks for raising that. So in, in philosophy, this is sort of known as the fat finger problem or the fat hand problem in, in different fields where you have a causal system and you try to intervene on parts of it, but you, your hand is too big and you sort of tap the whole system somehow. And um, together with Zachary Cohen uh, in California, I've been organizing what we call the Depression Symptom Response Project. I've been in this for a few years. There's no paper on this yet. But when we looked at the depression treatment literature, and I'm just going to use that as an example for your point, it's indeed unclear what interventions have which effects on which symptoms because in the literature, people just add all the symptoms up and say, you know, the total score on the back depression inventory improved by six points using antidepressants. But we don't actually know uh, symptom-based uh, responses. And so in this pro project, we've, I don't know, collected 150 or so data sets now, and we're trying to find out which particular treatments, psychotherapies, antidepressants, types of antidepressants, treat which particular symptoms um, in the, by reanalyzing existing data. Um, so I think there might be sort of localized effects, not just global effects, but we don't know about them because we don't assess localized constructs and we don't sort of analyze data accordingly because it's a little harder, of course. Multivariate analyses are, are challenging, but I truly believe that in, this, in the case of this example, treating insomnia and treating suicidal ideation are not the same type of thing. And um, yeah, and so I think it's worth investigating what symptoms improve under which type of treatment. Thank you. The next question we have is from Maria, and I think that's something that uh, some people might be struggling with. She says, if I'm correct, you need quite a lot of participants to fit structural equation models. How do you feel about studies with less participants using fairly simple models? Are these informative or not? Because it might only contain part of what we're essentially going for. Yeah, I, I totally believe that qualitative analyses or fitting a simple linear regression or t-test can help us to fundamentally establish robust effects in the world. And we need robust effects first, I think, to then explain them. Now, I think we, we have quite a few robust effects in psychology. Um, so at some point, we need to start with the explanation business, proper explanation, not just sort of like, you know, narrative descriptions of data. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think you need fancy models. SEM needs quite a bit of power, that's correct because it fits a lot of regressions at the same time. Um, but, but no, totally okay. And um, whenever, so Danny Borsboom was my first mentor in Amsterdam during my second postdoc. Um, and whenever I said, hey, Danny, you know, this model doesn't fulfill the assumptions or, you know, what about the heteroscedisticity or whatever. Danny, I think three or four times it happened in my two years there that Danny would just leave my office in the middle of our, he would turn around and leave. He's a really tall, tall guy. And, I, I would hear him walk back to his office, and then after 20 seconds, he would come back and drop a book on my desk. And it was always the same book by Paul Feyerabend called Against Method. And this book, 
makes the very strong argument that Darwin sucked at statistics. Newton sucked at math. Like a lot of Galileo was not a good mathematician. So a lot of, and they certainly didn't check if their linear regression had all assumptions fulfilled. Now it depends on my day of the time and my mood if I agree with this book or I don't agree with this book, because I do think it's important to check your assumptions of statistical tests. But it does make the point that you probably want to establish phenomena using a broad stroke of different techniques, uh, including qualitative observation, of course. Um, uh, and it doesn't have to be sophisticated models at all. Thanks. I think that is really reassuring. Um, and then we have one last question for now. Um, this is about um, factor analysis. So you said that alpha is not a good metric when using uh, factor analysis. Would you use omega instead? And can omega be used in the instance of polychoric co correlations? Well, that's a quite specific question. So I don't think, I didn't want to say that alpha is not a good metric to use for factor models. Um, I think it's a, not a good metric to use for network models because uh, um, Cronbach's alpha relies on the idea of, a, of an underlying, I believe, tau equivalent or congeneric factor, reflective latent variable model. If you believe that your items are related to each other because they cause each other, the strength of these relations doesn't necessarily matter for dropping an item from your data set. But if you think your 10 items measure the same underlying variable because the variable causes your 10 items, it makes a lot of sense to drop items that have a low factor loading because they don't indicate your latent variable very well. Why would you keep it if other variables do a better job indicating your latent variable? Now, there has been a lot of, of work on problems of Cronbach's alpha um, because it assumes you need dimensionality, it assumes uh, congeneric models that never hold. So you basically you assume that all your items have the same factor loading, which you just never have in psychology. And people have been uh, sort of uh, proposing omega as a replacement for that. I strongly endorse that that uh, replacement. Uh, Klaus Seitzma has a fantastic paper on problems of alpha and why you should use omega. And there's also some recent work by other folks. Um, Polychoric correlations, I don't know by heart um, uh, uh, if you can use omega, but I believe you estimate omega on the core covariance matrix. And I'm pretty sure that it doesn't matter how you produce your covariance matrix, be it polychoric, Spearman, Pearson, or whatever correlations. All right, thank you. Um, I guess maybe we can have uh, one last question before moving on. Yeah, um, thanks. So the questions keep on coming in. I I, I think mean, I, I, have, I have a little bit more time, but I know that you guys have a time time constraint and the, the video probably has a time constraint. So I'm, I'm, I'll do whatever. I'm, I'll be here for whenever you like to tell me to be here. It's okay. oh, no, we can go a bit over time. So let's uh, try to finish your questions then. Thank you. That's, that's really nice of you. Um, here's a question from Anonymous. I think you've very convincingly shown that uh, the importance of theory in our research. However, there uh, are almost certainly will remain a strong presence of hypothesis-free, or perhaps, as some might say, hypothesis-generating research. Given this, what advice do you have for researchers balancing these two worlds? Do you have any best practices for those interested in hypothesis-free slash generating work? So I, I was one of the, among the early people who started being part of this network research field that, that has sort of propagated broadly through psychology. I have a lot of papers in which I specifically say, we do not draw clinical implications because this work is hypothesis generating, right? Because reviewers kept pestering me in clinical journals that I need to tell them how to treat people now. And I said, well, this is one data set. This is one model. We're generating new hypothesis here. Calm down. Like we're not gonna conclude anything big from this paper. We're not there yet. Um, and I think that's completely valid. I, I stand behind that sort of work. I think we need hypothesis generating work, especially in new areas, especially using new models when we don't know much about causal relations among symptoms and so forth and so forth. The problem is when people approach research as hypothesis generating, but write up their papers as sort of confirmatory. Right? And we've seen that problem, especially in psychology, also in psychiatry. I'm not so sure about epidemiology. I don't know that field too well. But people sort of test all sorts of different things, but then they report selectively on the one test that led to a significant result. And it sort of confounds the exploratory and confirmatory nature of research. Um, maybe there are even better ways to think about this, but to answer the question, 
I think it's super valuable to be clear in your own research what part is exploratory and what part is confirmatory. And I think you should constrain yourself using pre-registration, for example, to, to what you want to work on. And then, of course, keep in mind, uh, some folks in the open science community always say this, that pre-registration is not a prison. You can totally deviate from your pre-registration. And if you have complex designs and complicated data, it happens all the time, even to the best of us who are really well prepared because data come in in a way you didn't expect. So you need to use polycolor correlations now because you have skew rather than spearmint correlations. That's completely fine. Just be transparent about it. And, and so I think the most interesting papers for me are those that are sort of in part hypothesis generating and explicitly so, and in part confirmatory, um, and, and describe that very clearly. And yeah, that's, that would be my response. So I think screw other people, be aware of your own work, what is hypothesis generating and what is confirmatory. Don't mix these up. And that's hard. Sometimes it's in the middle and you have to think about that to some degree. It's not really black and white as I'm pretending this, but that's how I, I, I think about it today, and I think that's useful as a sort of rough guideline. I think that's pretty good advice. Thank you. All right, then we actually have uh, quite quite a few questions left. So, um, assuming that you're still up for uh, staying here, um, there's one no from Peter um, saying the focus on formalization of theories does not solve the riddle of how to come up with awesome theories. Theory formation is and will always be verbal, and the focus on form formalization supports mindless quantification madness. It suggests that everything should or can be quantified, and it supports also empiricism. Thanks for that comment. Um, in, my, in the commentaries on my paper, this was a common theme, actually. You're not alone with that perspective, Peter. Um, in my rebuttal to these rejoinders, I make two points. The first is that, hell yeah, theory formation can be verbal and narrative, and that's important. Philosophy is in large part narrative, for example, although they have formalisms for logical language because it's just easier to write a logical statement in formalized language rather than verbal language. It saves you half a page. But you can do that precisely in narrative language. No problem at all. But I think so that's the first point. Formal theories are precise, so can verbal theories be. That's fine. And maybe we always don't need that sort of level of precision. But I think the second point is a sort of score for formal theories that verbal theories do not have. And that's the point that um, under a formal model or a formal theory, you can generate data to know what data you would expect given that your theory is true. And I only realized that about two years ago when I talked to Aishin, uh, Ryan, and, and Don Robino and Jonas Hasselbeck, who were working on this project, um, and we make this point in the Fine Calipers preprint that I linked to in the chat, um, using a very simple model of panic disorder. You, you make everything super simple. You have A and B, and there's a feedback loop between A and B. That's all you have. And then there's a, a loop on A to itself to calm down A once it gets too high. So you only have A and B, you have two arrows going back and forth, and on A you have a self loop to when A is high, it goes down. That's, as an example, we use that in the paper. So that's a super simple theory now. So now, depending on how you specify the relation between A and B and B and A, it can be linear, it can be sigmoidal, it can be nonlinear in other ways, you get fundamentally different model implied data. Um, and doing this in three or four different ways in our paper, the data look in a way that none of us theorists who wrote this thing would have expected the data to look like. So I think there's, I, I see your criticism, I see your point of, you know, people are over formalizing and over mathematizing and people are hiding bad ideas behind math. Totally valid, totally valid comments. I appreciate that. But I do think there's genuine uh, value in formalizing theories in that it A, can help you be more precise also to yourself and B, and that it can help you generate data and find out how your data would look like given your theory, which is simply impossible given a verbal model if there's any little complication to it. Anything but A causes B is super hard to mentally exercise through and in many cases just impossible. So I think that's my, that's my sort of two bullet point spiel for formal theories. 
All right, then we have a more practical question. Um, I would love to apply network modeling to epigenomic wide data, uh, epigenome wide data, sorry, but the regular R packages don't seem to accommodate these large data sets. Are you aware of any packages or other researchers using these methods in the omics field? Yeah, so I mean, then brain science people use network models way before us. And when I look for problems, statistical problems to solve in my field in psychology, I often look at the genetics network literature as well. So certainly these models are being used in these disciplines and have been maybe even longer than in psychology. I admit that the R packages that are available were not meant for millions of observations. And while it's in, I've done that to some degree with, I don't know, 600,000 people or something, R was not written for that. R was written for t-tests comparing two social psych groups with 30 people each, right? So the optimizers are not very good and they're getting better, but I think you want to use Python for that purpose. I, I'm, I'm not, or MATLAB. I'm, I, I don't usually advertise for other software, um, especially if it's not for free like MATLAB, but, but R was just not developed for that. And so um, I, if I had a grad student working on this, I would probably ask them to consider learning Python which is a stronger language anyway. But I don't know enough about epigenomics to to, uh, to know what sort of questions are common and what software is common in that field. Sorry. All right, thank you. Uh, the next one, um, are we restricted to what we can measure in constructing theories? It feels like otherwise we would face the situation you started with where we cannot uh, learn from the data in updating our theory. Sorry, can you say that again? I, I, I missed the first part due to the connection. Are we restricted to what we can measure in constructing theories? It feels like otherwise we would face the situation you started with, where we cannot learn from data in updating our theory. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, so measurement is on my mind a lot. I gave a talk yesterday called measurement, measurement. Um, I don't think so. I think... So let's go away from statistical models for a second. Let's go to theoretical, to theories and models. Uh, theories are something like gravitation or evolution, and models are instantiations of these theories for specific examples. Um, so a model can be a physical model of the, uh, the DNA that you can see in biology class, which is the thing you can touch. That's a model. It can be a verbal model. It can be a statistical model. It can be all sorts of models. Um, and models are uh, bridges between theories and the real world. That's how I think about that. Um, I talk about that a bit in detail in my rejoinder to the five commentaries. Um, and it, for a theory, it doesn't matter if you can measure stuff. For a model, for an instantiation where you want to go into the nitty-gritty details of a theory and look into a certain aspect, like the motion of planets, for example, for that you probably want to be able to measure the components. So I, I think for I think there's value in proposing theories um, that have components that are hard to measure um, in the first place. But that question that you raise already shows us that having formal models to begin with can be super helpful because it forces you to then also think about how to measure these components, which might be really hard in some cases. So for our formal theory disorder, we have some of the components that are easy to measure, and others are pretty difficult to get a grasp on, stuff like uh, cognitive schemata or, or other things that are not trivial to just ask on the phone or something like that. Um, or, or, or there's a... Uh, there's a task where you keep people in a, in a room and then you give them oxygen and then you reduce the oxygen intake and some people get, get sort of panic attacks or feel very unwell doing that. You can measure that and people differ from each other in that how quickly they get panic. It sounds horribly torturous, I'm sorry, but that's what, what we do in this field, unfortunately. Um, and that's, of course, measurable, but it's a, a huge burden to people. Like you need to get them in the lab and they need to do this and, and you need to do it multiple times. And that's really not very straightforward. So while that is a theoretical component in our model, it's going to be really tough to measure. And we don't quite know what to do about that yet. Perfect. Then we have, uh, well, we have two questions left. The first one is really minor. I think uh, someone is asking for a link because uh, there's an anonymous question saying, how can we comment on the panic 
paper and play with the relationships between components? Is there a link for that? So, yeah, so the panic paper I can link to right now. It's also in my talk, but I'll just do this here. Um, uh, one second, going through my own slides here. Panic disorder. Panic, I'm sorry, I'll be there. I can find it up. Get up immediately. Uh, here's the paper. Uh, there you go. Uh, the uh, graphical interface is not online yet. So we're still working on this. The paper is not submitted currently. We're revising it to resubmit it. And uh, ho hopefully we'll be able to write a graphical interface where people can play around with the components and, and add ed edges and stuff. There's nice software that allows you to, to do that online. Um, uh, yeah, but it's that is not available yet. Well, it sounds promising for the future then. And uh, if we go to the last question, this is a minor question about your agent-based model example uh, from Chenoas. Uh, what do you mean by that the project was a failure and the result was dependent on theorists' interpretations? Was it because theorists conceptualized depression differently? Uh, so that's one challenge, but we can ignore that here for the purpose of the argument and say, hey, let me look only at the one theory by Mark Taylor, who writes down in the most detailed of, so I take 15 papers with 15 theories of depression, and I take the paper now that we would all agree on is the most specified one, is the least ambiguous one. And even taking only that paper, trying to translate that paper into an agent-based model was absolutely impossible because Mark Taylor, the fictive researcher in this example, did in his theory paper not specify any of the relevant parameters for me to instantiate my model in, in the agent-based modeling software. How large, how many people are there in this in, in evolutionary group of people? How common is depression? How many agents will get depression? How long does depression? Very basic stuff like that. And that doesn't mean that Mark Taylor's theory is trash. It just means that it needs a lot more work and we should be careful considering it a theory. Um, and so, I can instantiate Mark's theory into my model in my software, but I make all the decisions now. I make all the decisions regarding all the parameters. And then if depression comes out as adaptive or not, it has really little to do with Mark's theory. It's mostly how I interpret Mark's paper. Right? Whenever you need the person who wrote the paper on the phone to ask them questions, the theory is probably not explicated enough. That's a really high bar, but you know that's something to strive for, I guess, in the next few decades. Yeah, I think that's a, a, a nice one to uh, close the session off with, that we hope that this will improve a lot in the next 10 years. That would be really nice to see. Um, just to short, shortly conclude, thank you a lot for being here with us today. Uh, also, everyone who stayed to the very end, thank you for uh, staying with us. Um, we'll close this session and we'll have another from our Rotterdam site in November on the 20th at 2 o'clock CEST which will be by Stephen Cole and which will be titled, How Do We Ask Better Questions and Get Better Answers? So thank you again, all of you, for being here today, and we'll see you at the end of November. Bye, guys. Thanks for having me.